we move to the second part of this lecture series, which will focus on, you know, emphasizing this term ancestry, right? The last, the last one, you know, talked about more about race and, you know, what could we use that in terms of applying it to biological variation and, you know, very little is is represented there but there are some signatures that we see in the skull that might represent that small a bit of a variation and so that is also important to law enforcement it's on many missing persons uh, reports and is usually a variable that's contained within them so it's something that can help us with positive identification so we march on to the biological profile. We've already looked at sex determination, not gender, age at death, right chronological age, and now to ancestry, which is the term we're going to use instead of race because we are, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at ancestral heritage and um, it's not always easy to place, but there is some slight variation that we can notice in in the skull and i'll show you exactly where and then we'll move to things like living stature which we need to know ancestry to typically make a, a solid stature estimation and then if we can get to some pathology we will do so so we use the term ancestry because that's effectively what you're doing you're you're looking at the you know the ancestral line of the decedent that you see before you because both genes as well as the traits that manifest from those genes that you can view, they are because of uh, ancestral heritage and they can be from specific continental groups. Um, race that is not a good term to encap encapsulate uh, the, the biological variation that you see before you. And we do this in, in two different um, ways in terms of methodology. When we look at the skull, typically it's uh, the most variable in the area of the face. When you look at the cranial vault, which houses the brain, right, the brain case, that doesn't look as variable. When we, and then I'm talking about historically based on analysis and, and results from published material and studies and it's only really those facial characteristics that are character states we can view with the naked eye and those are known as morphoscopic traits uh, or morphoscopics morphometrics uh, those are traits that you're quantifying using tools to measure them and you know this would be like the length of the the crania the width of the crania um, again even with those metric measurements the greatest variability is in the face so both what we see as well as what we can measure uh, appreciably something is different in the face and what we've noticed is it may not even be from genes it looks like the most conserved genes would be responsible for the cranial base and cranial vault you know, housing the brain case, the bones that articulate with the brain. But it is the facial uh, characteristics that are more modified by the environment. And that might be the signal that we're getting from different geographic backgrounds of, of these, these disparate ancestral lines that create this variation. So we're going to go through a number of morphoscopic traits because of those are the easiest to really kind of disseminate through our online environment and, and look at some images of, you know, how that variation manifests. And then I'll, you know, quickly and briefly talk about morphometrics and how they're applied. But scopic meaning what you can see and morphology meaning shape or size of something that is observable that you, you know, kind of put in a number of different categories or bins of expression and they are subjective they're categorical in terms of uh, their you know data category and most of them are found in the crania uh, 
and um, we don't really have a good set system for postcrania and we're not even really sure what that variation would be or what it looks like um, the skull and the face uh, have always been the mainstay in, deter in, in determining these things and typically we can you know you know accurately assess a skull um, that's unidentified person into three to four uh, major ancestral groups, including European, Asian, uh, African, and Native American. You uh, you could also think of something like European or Euro-American. Um, you could also say things like African or African-American. You can say Native American or American Indian. American Indian is a, is a protected status, by the way. Uh, you also see people use things like white and black, right? Um, and of course, you know, there are ideas about whiteness, there's ideas about uh, black and the black experience, and how does that equate with biology, right? Those are some of the issues with assigning uh, and using uh, a social construct with, with something that um, biologically might not have as, as much influence as as well as you should use terms like this as opposed to traditionally what is known what are known as the oids right here i have a hex in there right caucasoid and you know some of the other oids that were used and that's kind of where they come from initially and it's a bit of a dark side dark history of of physical or biological anthropology where many many early physical anthropologists people that were interested in skulls, they were obsessed with them, measuring them uh, and putting them into categories. And, and we're not really interested in doing that anymore. We're just, we're interested in, in variation. Now, yeah, with, with variation comes in differentiation, you can create categories in bins, but then to talk about uh, them and their characteristics as oids or as you know essential components of, of a group it is not very helpful so avoid this terminology completely it's old it's outdated and it's it's a bit racist here are a number of traits that we're going to go through one by one but here they are all in one page for you here are the cranial facial traits that we identify and and observe and, and, and record and evaluate to determine if we can, you know, narrow it down to one of these three or four ancestral groups, including nasal bridge projection, nasal aperture, width and shape, uh, the nasal bone configuration, uh, whether there is sealing or guttering at the inferior aspect of the, the nasal aperture, uh, is there prognathism or jutting out of the of, of alveolus or face? Uh, is there sutural complexity, which sometimes is effective, but other times not? And then orbital shape has also been shown to be uh, quite effective in making this determination. We'll start with nasal bridge projection. What we typically notice is that uh, Europeans oftentimes have the greatest projection of their nasal bridge. Now, what do we mean by the nasal bridge? We're talking about the most anterior uh, aspect of the nasal bones. Remember that the, you do have a bony nose. Most of it is cartilage, but you can even feel it on, on, the, on your nose now where you have the most anterior projection of, uh, in that space, in that, you know, that aspect or dimension um, of, of the nasal bones. Asian and, and African uh, people of those descents, they typically do not have uh, a projecting nasal bridge. And um, we're going to talk about a number of these features like the nasal bridge, the nasal aperture, and the nasal sill. You can see there's a chart here showing you the components of each. So now you know where those landmarks are and we begin discussing them. But look at the skulls on the right. Uh, you have A, B, and C. Which one of these 
has the greatest nasal bridge projection in the anterior view or aspect. If you guessed A, you're correct. B and C do not have any uh, nasal projection or uh, it's very weak. Um, and, and then uh, if you look at Uh, B and C, B is actually uh, an individual uh, with African heritage and C is an individual with Asian heritage. But you can see that by nasal bridge, it's very distinguishable which individual has European or Euro-American ancestry. You have to use some of the other features to distinguish B and C, but you can practice with some of these other features as we go along, go through this uh, lecture. When you look at the the shape of the nasal aperture. And we're not quite sure why this happens, but we know that the environment has the greatest influence on the, f- the, the facial part of, of the skull and, and not as much as the brain case. And what we do notice is that the shape of the nasal aperture, you can see that in Europeans or Euro-American ancestry, the ancestral heritage, that the nasal shape is very narrow uh, and in African heritage, African people with those that, you know, those that line of descent, it's usually a little wider and broader and Asian people are uh, typically um, intermediate. There are features, not just at the nasal aperture, but also on the nasal bone that you can use to uh, you know, identify that are in consort, right? So if you have a, na- a narrow nasal aperture, typically you also have a narrow or pinched uh, nasal bone. You can see that on the Euro-American, European uh, ancestral skull, that there's, it's almost like pinched up at the, uh, the uh, just above, right? Just superior of the nasal bridge where it articulates with the frontal and the maxilla. Uh, you can see that in African people, you don't have, or, or those in, with African descent, uh, you don't have the uh, pinching at that same interse- intersection because the nasal aperture is much wider and broader. Uh, you don't get that uh, congestion from a, a narrow nasal aperture you see uh, in the picture on the left. Again, because of the configuration of all these features, they have associated features, and that has to do with the shape and configuration of the nasal aperture. Uh, when you have a narrow nasal aperture, you also usually develop what's known as a, a nasal sill. Uh, you can see the picture on the left where you it's observable, most observable in people with European ancestry, um, that you have almost not just pinching at the nasal bone, but you have this pinching at the, uh, you know, the, the base of the nasal aperture. And you can see with the black arrows, there's, there's the pinching there. Because of the narrow nasal aperture, you have a, a feature associated with known as nasal sealing. And uh, when you look at African uh, people or people with African heritage, you will see because of the wide nasal aperture, uh, you won't have sealing and pinching you will have kind of guttering or widening. You can also see, you can see with the black arrows on the image on the right uh, that it almost looks like these kind of tunnels that are at the base or the inferior aspect of the nasal opening. Suture complexity has been discussed as as, as a possible way to get to an ancestral estimate for unidentified remains. However, it remains to be seen that this method is, is accurate. Um, what some people have suggested is that people with European or Euro-American ancestry have simple suture variation, you know, at the intersections of a number of a number of different skull bones. Whereas when you look at Asian and Native American uh, skulls, you will have more complex suture lines. Now, in my experience, uh, 
I have seen in Native American uh, bones that there are more complex suture lines. Uh, however, does that mean that is always going to be the case? And then I can't really quantify that to you. We just It's just a pattern or something that we know. If I was to, uh, if this was the only way to make a determination, I'm not sure how confident I would be, uh, but hopefully there's something else that can be used uh, that will, you know, have a, a better determination. Patterns of over orbital shape have also been shown to be reliable in terms of making an ancestral determination. You can see that um, when you look at the configuration of the the orbits in, in somebody with European or Euro-American ancestry, they look kind of angled. Um, and in African um, ancestral groups, it looks like they're more rectangular. And then in people with Asian descent, they look circular or, um, you know, much more uniform than the other two. Now, of course, we don't know why. This is just a pattern we observe. This is a wonderful feature. And matter of fact, it's one of my favorites because it is actually quite accurate. And it also, um, it actually shows a connection between people of, of Asian and Native American descent that they have a connection and we you know we observe that even in DNA right that Native American people most closely cluster with uh, Asia in terms of another continental group and that's probably why they share this feature which is known as shovel shaped incisors so the image on the left which you're looking at is the maxilla turned upside down looking at the inferior view and looking at the central uh, and in this case, the also the right lateral incisor, and they look like little shovels. Where you on the on the aspect that is facing your tongue, or what's known as the lingual ap aspect, uh, there is this guttering or shoveling of the teeth, and it is unmistakable in Native American remains. Uh, I'm not sure how it is quantified or quantified. In, in people of Asian descent, but I have literally identified Native American skeletons with just teeth like this. Um, a discovery we made in, in the Bahamas, uh, and when we uncovered the teeth, I saw the shovel-shaped incisors. The, the advisors that I was with and directors of that field uh, operation at that site they asked me how confident I was in making that determination. I said, I'm pretty, pretty confident because they're, they're the only group that would be here. Um, and uh, that type of tooth morphology is unmistakable uh, for Native American people. We just went through a bunch of morphoscopics, right? Things that we, that are morphological, that have different shape and characteristics, but they're ones that we can see with the naked eye. There are, um, you know, morphometric methods where we could actually take a bunch of different measurements on land landmarks, set landmarks that are uniform for anybody that takes the measurements on the skull, and then, you know, put them in a computer or statistical program and it will tell us about the probability of it being longing to specific collections or groups that we know, you know, what their language is, what's their ancestral heritage is. Um, you know, places like the Terry and the Todd Hammond collection, right? They are war dead. They are people, uh, that some of them are from very diverse backgrounds. If we can, we do an analysis and it shows that they cluster most to you know, black or African-American people that are in the charity collection, that would be a way to assess ancestral, uh, uh, you know, group for unidentified remains. And it will give you like a most probable ancestor group. Prob probability is what we discuss in terms of statistics. Now there's a program called 4DISC, which I have here in all caps. Uh, that's from the Forensic Data Bank that was created at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, same place where the first body farm popped up, you know, under Bill Bass. Um, they've 
they've created a program that you can plug those measurements in and then it will give you some output. And the good thing about morphometrics as opposed to morphoscopics is that morphometrics seem a little more objective, a little more unbiased, and, and they're not categorical. And of course, it's not as subjective as somebody just kind of going through and trying to determine the shape and, and morphology of a number of different features in the cranial uh, facial skeleton. So, you know, if you had your, your choice, you'd probably both do morphoscopic as well as morphometric analysis, and then you would use that information to uh, collectively to make your final uh, determination.